and which is the nature of politics. And you start saying, all right, tell me about political organisms, and how do they work? And what you discover is that there are all sorts of trappings, whether it's hail to the chief before the president walks in, whether it's the speaker walking in and banging the gavel and saying the house is now in order. And then you begin to sort out how, and you can see it in a room, you can see it. If you watch C-SPAN with the sound off when we're voting, and just watch the transactions. Marianne says it's like watching kindergarten at recess, and all the little kitties are running around chatting with each other. But it's, but it's good for us to relax about the humanness of what we're doing. It's good for us to accept that we're going to get the best 435 humans in the House, and the best 100 humans in the Senate, and the best human we can for president and vice president. And then they're all going to be humans with all the passions, all the confusion, all the complexities, all the ego problems, all the insecurities that are what being humans about. And then you can relax and you have a much richer and deeper and more interesting experience. Two really good books on this are both by Edward T. Hall. Uh, one is called The Silent Language and the other is called Hidden Communication. What Hall did is he studied how do people interact non-verbally? How close do people stand? Greeks stand much closer than Germans. What does being on time mean? I mean, something very different for Germans and Brazilians. And you begin to look at different kinds of body language. I, I was given them by a uh, Texan who had been assigned by Texaco to be the vice president of computing. He'd never been out of the state of Texas. And he arrived in, in Brussels, and he walked in this room, and he said about a month later he figured out that the body language of a Swede and an Italian is radically different. That a Swede can be furious and give you no body language signals that they're mad. An Italian can just be making a point. <laughs> and you think that they're enraged. And that he literally went to these two books. He went, as a businessman, he read these two books to begin to get the cross-cultural sense of what are people saying to each other. And what I'm driving at here, of course, is that you have to start with all of the nonverbal, biological natures of being human as an underpinning of politics. This is why the Founding Fathers were geniuses. Because they said, OK, we don't care how much you tell us you're going to be wonderful. You're a person. Sooner or later, you're going to break down. Sooner or later, you're going to want to seize power. Sooner or later, you're going to forget everybody else. How do I design a machine so when you are at your worst, you can't do too much damage to the country? It is a brilliant design for avoiding dictatorship. Now, what Frank Kent did in his book, The Great Game of Politics, is he came along and he said, look, and this was written in the 1920s, here's how the game is played. I was looking at it late last year. It's remarkably similar today. Now, we do it with television, not with newspapers, nearly as much. We do it with different kinds of advertising. We have more consultants. You know, our political bosses are electronic. They're consultants rather than being geographic. But you still have, you still have very similar processes, and it's well with your study. Robert Heinlein wrote a little book just before World War II called uh, Take Back Your Government. And uh, it's a practical handbook for the private citizen who wants democracy to work. And it's a fun little book. It's been republished uh, uh, recently. And, and uh, I really recommend it to you just as a way of seeing. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, it was written in 1946. And, and I really recommend it to you. It's, pa it's in paperback. And it's just an interesting introduction from a guy who was a science fiction writer and a patriot and understood how hard it was to get a free society to work. Now, the dilemma of Common Cause and Ralph Nader is that they love the concept of helping the people but they despise the process by which politics operates. Any contribution given must be corrupt. Any appearance of corruption must be evil. Therefore, since and so in, in essence, they end up in a totally socialist system in which all politics would occur within government. And it's a model which is, in fact, I think, in the long run, very, very dangerous to a free society. The dilemma of the newsroom and the editorial boards is a different dilemma. It is, on the one hand, how do they cover as a legitimate skeptic? The difference between a skeptic and a cynic. A skeptic says, I'd like to believe you're sincere, but you've got to convince me. A cynic says, I know you're not sincere, so let me, find where, let me figure out how to get the mask to put, be pulled off. And, and starting with Watergate, I think, and, and with uh, Vietnam, we went from a healthy, skeptical news media that loved politics and understood it. Go back and read the great legislative reporters of the 1950s, their attitude towards the president, their attitude towards the Congress. They loved the business they covered. They thought it was incredibly important. Didn't mean they didn't report scandals. Didn't mean they didn't report human foibles. But they did it within a larger framework of saying, 
this is this remarkable American romanticism. And then look starting with uh, the mid to late 60s, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Vietnam, and Watergate. Somebody could do a fascinating study of the change in tone, the change in assumptions, and the change in, in, in uh, what was legitimate behavior by the media. And you now have a devastatingly more cynical, devastatingly more adversarial system, which makes it harder to report the truth. Because the truth isn't always cynical. The truth is often romantic and wonderful. America is a great country with a good people. And if you're not allowed to report that, because that would clearly not be cynical enough and you'd be laughed at in the newsroom, you literally distort the whole context of how America operates. What we have to do is invent honest self-government and politics for the 21st century. We got to go back and, and notice the term I use, honest self-government. Yes, I think standards matter, and yes, I think you have to say we're, we're determined to have an honest system. That means you've got to, I think, invent citizenship and community for the 21st century, and you've got to apply the spirit of invention and discovery. You've got to go back out and say, how can we get this to work? What are the things, whether it's computerization, whether it is uh, town hall meetings that are electronic, whether it is putting the Congress on, online, as we have with Thomas at the Library of Congress, how do we reestablish in the 21st century this sense of citizenship and community? How do we apply quality to create citizenship and community? You know, how would Deming have approached all this? And how can we have continuous improvement and a sense of all of us as a large American team working to create a better way of doing things? I would suggest to you that, that as part of that, that there are four roles of a leader and that we often do this backwards. That the first role of a leader is to set the agenda and communicate goals and standards. That the second role of a leader is to convey symbolic power. That is, when the mayor or the governor or the president shows up, the act of their being there makes the meeting more important. They, they symbolize their community. The third is to gather resources outside their own system. That is, they say, let's go and create something, and they get volunteers, they get private sector money, they focus the attention of the community on doing something. Only the fourth is managing their own bureaucratic system. Now, what happens to you in Washington and what happens to you at state capitals is running the government narrowly defined, running this part of your society. Remember, the leader is the leader of all this. 